The first thing I'd like to do is welcome everyone to the Johns Island Regional Library. Thank you so much for coming out on a beautiful spring morning to hear this program called From Charleston Slavery to African Freedom, Two Amazing True Stories. And I have the privilege of being Nick Butler, your Charleston County Public Library historian. And my job is to really act as an ambassador for the library system and go around the community and giving talks about local history and try to inspire people to pursue a love of lifelong learning. And that's why you're here today, to learn some stories that perhaps you never heard about. And speaking of stories, you know, why do people go to libraries? People go to libraries mostly to check out novels. You know, this time of year you're thinking about beach reading or spring break <laughs> reading. And people check out DVDs. People want to watch movies because we love stories. As a civilization, as a, a community of people, everybody loves stories. And as a historian, I think of myself as a storyteller. There are so many stories out there that you've never heard about. And some of these stories would make great motion pictures or great novels. And it just takes somebody, you know, maybe some in, the, in this audience, to take some stories like this and turn it into the next blockbuster or the next big uh, novel. Uh, so I'm going to try to inspire you today by talking about two amazing true stories that have a lot in common. They're very parallel stories, as you'll see, but they started off in, in very different arenas. And um, I'm going to tell you, before we go any further, about this painting that you see. This wonderful image that you see was painted about the year 1774 by a man named Thomas Leach. And it's just called simply A View of Charlestown. Uh, and that painting now exists in North Carolina at the Museum of Early Southern Decorative Arts. So this is a real painting by a real artist of downtown Charleston, as you would have seen coming in from the harbor uh, and looking at East Bay Street at downtown Charleston. And this is a good scene to begin our journey because the port of Charleston, South Carolina that we see here was the site of, um, of arrival for about 40% of all the enslaved Africans who were brought to North America. So about 200,000 enslaved Africans came through the port of Charleston between uh, the late 16th, late 1600s and the early, early 1900s. About 200,000 people. That's about 40% of all of the enslaved Africans who came to North America in general. This would have been the site that those people saw. Speaking of people, I want you to remember that we're talking about real people. We're not talking about fictional made up characters. We're talking about real people who lived and died and they married, they had families, they had ups and they had downs. We're talking about real people. And I wanted to show you this image. These are real people. This is not a fictional scene. This is a, a painting that's traditionally called the old plantation. We know now that the artist for this painting was a, a plantation owner between Charleston and Beaufort, South Carolina, named John Rose. And it was painted sometime between 1785 and 1790, which incidentally is the time period that we're going to be talking about today. So we have no idea what the names of these people are. We have no idea what this festive occasion was. Maybe it's a wedding of some kind. Maybe they're jumping the broom, listening to the banjo, which is a West African instrument, and the drum. Uh, these people historically don't have voices. We have no idea how these people felt or lived or loved. We just have this image of them to mark their existence. And for enslaved African people in Charleston, in South Carolina, we have very, very few voices that survived down through history. We don't have their words, their thoughts. But today I want to tell you two true stories about two men who lived in South Carolina, like these people, as enslaved people, who escaped and had a voice. They wrote down parts of their own lives. We know how they felt and their ups and downs, and who they married, and what their children were, because they escaped this enslaved situation. And we're going to take those two stories to kind of represent the lives of many, many people who we may never know their voices. So today's feature involves two people that maybe you've heard of, maybe you haven't. The first we're going to talk about is a man named Boston King. And Boston King left behind a short memoir, his own words about his life. Just basically a short narrative 
of his beginnings in South Carolina all the way up through his adult life, and it was uh, published in London in the late 18th century. And we're going to talk more about him. And our second story is about a man named John Kizel or Kaisel. Uh, there's no, no consensus on how to pronounce his last name. John left behind not a memoir, but actually correspondence and reports, his letters to and from uh, people in England and in West Africa after he had escaped slavery in South Carolina. So we have a much richer collection of materials from John Kaisel, but it's not an overarching kind of summary of his life as we have with Boston King. So I'm going to talk about Boston King first, and then we'll come back to John Kaisel. These men did not know each other in South Carolina, but then later in life, they're following a very similar path out of slavery towards freedom and back to Africa, and they did know each other. So these men are just two representatives of a phenomenon that thousands of people uh, experienced, a, a journey that thousands of people experienced. But these are two people which have local connections that I want to use as examples. And we're going to start off with Boston King. And on the, on the right side of the screen, you see the cover of a recently published book that's basically the life and times of Boston King. And uh, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about this book and encourage you to read it. We have copies in the Charleston County Library system, so you can check it out for yourself. Um, John, K excuse me, <laughs> Boston King is born, according to his own testimony, he's born in South Carolina in the year 1760. His parents were enslaved people here in South Carolina. So his parents probably came from Africa as uh, enslaved people into South Carolina. We don't know their names, uh, but we know that John, excuse me, Boston is born right here in the low country of South Carolina in 1760. His family, because they were enslaved, they are owned by the Waring family. And the, this branch of the Waring family that owned Boston King and his family lived at Beach Hill Plantation, which is the, the upper Ashley River. Today we would call that Dorchester Road area, you know, upper reaches of Somerville, that neck of the woods. So not downtown Charleston, not Johns Island where we are now, but the upper, upper Ashley River around Dorchester. And at age nine, according to Boston's own memoir, at age nine he was put to work. So up to age nine he's just a boy running around playing games with other children. Age nine he is an enslaved worker on this Waring family plantation. Specifically, he says that he was put out to mind the cattle and the horses on this plantation. And that may seem like kind of a strange occupation, but actually it's a very, very common occupation for young boys and maybe even young girls in colonial era South Carolina, where we didn't necessarily have big pastures with fences around them where the cattle were kept but the cattle were allowed to kind of pre-range in the savannas around the swamps of the low country. And so instead of building fences, you might have a several hundred acres and the cattle are out there grazing in the woods and somebody's got to go mine them. Somebody's got to go make sure that they're all kind of coming in for food when they need it or keep track of them so they don't wander off onto somebody else's plantation. So that's a big job in early South Carolina. There are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of young African, African-American boys who are tending or minding cattle and horses in early South Carolina. And guess what? It's an African job, too. Mm -hmm. So I just looked on the internet and found a few images. This is an occupation that you will find young men and even perhaps young ladies doing in Africa today. This is a traditional job that even if Boston King had been born in Africa, as a nine-year-old boy, this might have been what he was doing. Um, you know, not that I'm trying to excuse slavery at all, but it was a job that was very common for boys of his age to do. And in case you're interested, now, caveat here, I am working for a library, so it's my job to encourage you to read. There's actually a book about this uh, published uh, in 2012 about black ra ranching frontiers, early, early African cattlemen in America. Who were the first cowboys in America? It's not those guys out in Texas. It's, it's enslaved Africans in the low country of South Carolina and Georgia and Virginia uh, and North Carolina who are uh, minding the cattle. So 
great story if you want to pursue that. That would make a great motion picture too, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, somebody's got to do that. Okay, back to Boston King. At age 16, he's taken out of the cattle field, and he's apprenticed to a master carpenter in downtown Charleston. And that may surprise some people to know that enslaved African boys and girls were often given apprenticeships. They learned trades. They learned how to be artisans. They had a, a, a trade skill. They're not just unskilled labor. So this was not uncommon at all. He is actually, his master is paying for him to have an apprenticeship. And after six, seven years in an apprenticeship, he will be a professional carpenter. And for the Waring family, that means that Boston would be worth much more money. But Boston never made it that far because of the American Revolution. In 1776, of course, uh, the fighting begins here in South Carolina. This is a painting of the British Navy attacking the unfinished Palmetto Log Fort on Sullivan's Island in June of 1776. So I'm not going to go down a rabbit hole and talk a lot about the revolution. But, of course, the, the revolution interrupted so many lives, including people like Boston King's life. So at age 16, he's sent to Charleston. He's still a young boy. He hasn't been in Charleston that long. And the war begins. The British are trying to capture Charleston in 1776, and they failed. But four years later, they actually succeeded. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me just mention another book. This is a very tense time, the beginning of the revolution, a very tense time to be an enslaved person in Charleston or in the Low Country because the British are trying to capture South Carolina and we're trying to become a free state and African, African Americans are caught in the middle and they've got to pick a side. They can stay loyal to their masters and remain in slavery or they can take a chance and say, you know, the British might be able to get me out of this enslaved situation. I'm going to do something for the British. They've got to make a choice. And it was a dangerous choice. So an example would be Thomas Jeremiah. Thomas Jeremiah, or Jerry as he was frequently called, was a free black pilot. That is, he's working, leading ships, big ships, into the harbor of Charleston. He's, he's a harbor pilot. And in 1775, because he's free and because he has this kind of independent situation, many white po folks in town think he might be a British spy mm -hmm. and he is working on the British side. So he's arrested, summary trial, and he's hung or hanged in Charleston in 1775. It's such a good story that two different men published books about him at the same time, uh, just a couple of years ago. That's going to or should be made into a motion picture one of these days. I mean, it's a really good, interesting, dramatic story. But it, I, I include it today to mention that it's indicative of the challenges, the dangers, the tension that's in Charleston at the beginning of the American Revolution. And even if Thomas Jeremiah didn't hear these words, there were rumors about that the British Army was going to offer freedom to enslaved Americans at the beginning of this war. And it actually happened uh, on two different occasions. So Lord Dunmore, this is John Murray, the last British royal governor of Virginia. In 1775, he makes a proclamation that we know is Lord Dunmore's proclamation. He promised freedoms to, freedom to slaves in Virginia who fled from their rebel masters. So if your master is siding with the Americans in Virginia, if you leave them and go to the British side, Lord Dunmore is promising freedom. But that really applied to Virginia. A couple of years later, we have the Phillipsburg Proclamation. This is made by General Henry Clinton, who's in charge of British North American forces in 1779. He made this proclamation in New York, but it applied to all the colonies. And he said that all slaves in these United States, these rebellious colonies that are calling themselves the United States, he says all of those are actually free people and they can take advantage of their freedom by leaving their masters and siding with the British. That's 1779. That's exactly what Abraham Lincoln did in 1863 with the uh, Emancipation Proclamation. He said, Lincoln said, all the slaves in those slave states are now free. They just have to come north to take advantage of their freedom. So Lord uh, Clinton is saying exactly the same thing. So there are enslaved people all over the colonies who have to make a choice. Am I going to stay with my master where I have family and I'm comfortable and, you know, I understand the world around me? Or am I going to abandon everything and take a chance and flee to the British? 
And a lot of people did exactly that. Um, but before I get ahead of myself again, let me just answer a question about what enslaved African people and African American people did during the American Revolution. So school children have asked me this from time to time. What did, what did black folks do during the American Revolution? Mm -hmm. And my answer to that, and your answer to that, if anybody should ask, is what didn't they do <laughs> during the American Revolution? Yes, they carried weapons on occasion and fought. What else did they do? They were cooks and washers, but nurses, hostlers, taking care of horses. Uh, they're butchers, foragers. They're finding food. They're slaughtering animals for the soldiers to eat because the army's got to eat. They're coopers. They're making barrels to pack stuff in to go on the road so the army can travel. They're blacksmiths repairing weaponry. They're carpenters building shelters. They're tailors making and repairing uniforms. They're carters and wagoners. They're waiters, which is just kind of an all-purpose servant kind of position. They're barbers. Uh, they're pioneers, and that's a great position because they've got to go ahead of the army and clear a path. Mm -hmm. So they have to go into uncharted territory, and you know, there are a thousand men marching behind you. You've got to clear a path. Mm -hmm. That's what the pioneers are doing. They're mariners working on the sea. They're pilots like Thomas Jeremiah was. They're couriers carrying secret messages from the battlefield to the headquarters. They're spies, and they're musicians. They're, you know... African Americans did so much during the American Revolution that they don't get credit for. Some on the American side, and of course some on the British side. So many people said, you know, I'm going to take a chance. So in May of 1780, the British Army, after a siege of almost two months in length, the British Army captured the city of Charleston. And by default, you know, the low country of South Carolina was under British control starting in May of 1780. Age 20, Boston, who's living on the upper Ashley River, says, you know, I'm going to take a chance. I'm going to head down to Charleston and see if I can finagle my way out of slavery. So he leaves his family at age 20 and goes kind of into uncharted territory. And we know from his own memoir that throughout the rest of 1780, he's traveling through South Carolina with the British Army. Is he a soldier in uniform? Probably not. But... Think of one of those positions I just mentioned. He's fulfilling one of those many positions with the British Army. And in 1781, he's kind of a free man. He's not enrolled in the British Army. He's a free agent. So about the year 1781, it's a little unclear in his own memoir, uh, but sometime after he gained his freedom, he sails from Charleston to New York. So he sails out of Charleston Harbor and goes to New York. And he's captured at sea by American, or kind of, proto-navy of the American forces, captured at sea and taken to New Jersey, which is still in American control at that time. Sometime in 1782, again, it's a little unclear in his own memoir, Boston King escaped from New Jersey and went to New York, which was held by the British Army at that time. So he's back in British control territory where he is comfortably a free man at that time. And there he met a woman named Violet. We don't know much about Violet, but in Boston's memoir, he says there he met and married a woman named Violet, and they started a family. But right about that time, in 1782, the British start withdrawing from the United States because the Battle of Yorktown in October of 1781, it was not the end of the war, but it was a decisive victory for George Washington and the American Army. So from October of 1781 onward, Everybody knew that the British were going to eventually abandon this war and leave the North American continent. The, the writing was on the wall. The British Army knew it. The American Army knew it. So we start demilitarizing. But it's certainly not the end of the war. So throughout 1782, the British are pulling out of various colonies and packing up their belongings and leaving. And uh, so that's a major part of the rest of our story. So in August of 1782, Boston King is among a number of people who pack up under the auspices of the British Army and say, you know, we're going to have to abandon New York. We need to find other places for these people. And the British Army had kind of a strange situation because by the end of 1781, the beginning of 1782, there were thousands of formerly enslaved people of African descent who had fled to the British side because they were promised freedom. 
because Britain thought they were going to win the war. But now it's clear that Britain's losing the war. What are we going to do with these thousands of formerly enslaved people? We promised them freedom, but if we leave them here, they're not going to be free. So we have to move them. So Boston King is among a group of people who moved to a new place, a brand new town created just for them called Birchtown, Nova Scotia. And for those of you who are not intimately familiar with uh, Canadian geography, let's take a quick look at the map. So here's Charleston down here on the east coast of North America, and New York is about a thousand miles to the north. Uh, there's New Jersey and New York. And so Boston King made that trip in 1781, and then 1782, he's moving up to Nova Scotia, that uh, big landmass off the coast of Maine, basically. Let's zoom in a little bit. So Maine on the left, Nova Scotia on the right, so coming up from New York, and uh, Birchtown, Nova Scotia, is near the southeast coast of Nova Scotia. Um, so that's where he went. And the British Army was really good about keeping records. They're moving a lot of resources around, people and ammunition and weaponry and all kinds of resources being moved around. The British Army keeps really good records. So when they're moving people, when the British authorities are moving people en masse, out of North America and finding new homes for many of these people, they created records. And the records of these formerly enslaved people who are moved is called, in the, in the record itself, it's called The Book of Negroes. And this is a real book that actually exists. It's a document created by British officers in New York and places uh, uh, associated with New York in 1783. It includes a about 3,000 names of what traditionally we call black loyalists. So are these people really loyal to the British crown? Well, maybe, maybe not. But these are people who fled their American masters to gain freedom with the British. So the British called them loyalists. Uh, they are resettled from places like South Carolina, Virginia, North Carolina, to Nova Scotia. So people who, like Boston King, and left South Carolina, ended up in New York, and now is being moved to Nova Scotia. And Boston King and Violet are here in the book of Negroes. There are three copies of this book, and you, and you can learn more about the book of Negroes online. There are three manuscript copies made at the same time because the British made triplicate records of stuff. So there's one copy in our National Archive in Washington, D.C. There's one copy in the Nova Scotia archives, and there's one copy at the National Archives of the United Kingdom back in Q. So there are three contemporary manuscript copies, and you can read more about it online. It's a fascinating kind of document. Yeah. Ruth Whitehead, a, a local uh, girl who's moved to Nova Scotia, wrote a book about that. I'll tell you more about that in just a moment. But meanwhile, back to Boston King. So in August of 1782, Boston arrives in Birchtown, Nova Scotia. It's a town created by the British authorities for these resettled people of African descent. And so we know that Boston and Violet are there uh, for the next several years. Sometime, according to his own memoir, about 1783 or 1784, Violet and Boston become religious. And, you know, frankly, if you've been delivered from the bonds of slavery to freedom, wouldn't you get a little bit of religion too? So not uncommon among their uh, contemporaries. We know that in 1785, Boston became a Methodist preacher. He's not only religious, but he come, becomes a, an evangelist, a preacher for the Methodist denomination. And around that time, in the late 1780s, early 1790s, there's a lot of talk about maybe we should find a new home for these formerly enslaved people. And some of that talk was kind of positive-oriented, like, you know, maybe, maybe we could find a better place to live, maybe we could uh, make our way back to our ancestral home. Part of that talk was kind of negative, like, we got to get these people out of here. Neighbors not necessarily liking the Birchtown community, who were saying, you know, maybe the British government should put them somewhere else. Um, and for many of these formerly enslaved people who were resettled in Nova Scotia, they were looking for better ground because, literally better ground, because on the rocky coast of Nova Scotia, there's a lot of land, but it's not land you can plant stuff in. And can you imagine if you come from South Carolina to a winter in Nova Scotia, maybe that's not your cup of tea. So you're looking for a better place to live. So 
the late 1780s, there's a discussion growing, not only in Nova Scotia, but in England as well, a discussion about maybe finding another home for these people. And then I have to introduce you to what becomes eventually the Sierra Leone Company. And this is one of their trade tokens uh, for the Sierra Leone Company. It's a great, great image. Um, 1786, a group of people in London, this is kind of a backstory of the Sierra Leone Company. Uh, a group of people in London created a group called the Committee for the Relief of the Black Poor. And here's an interesting uh, semantic note. In 1786, the black poor in London included not only people of African descent, but people of, of East Indian descent. So people who were just not white. They were all kinds of different colors, but just not uh, Caucasian British folk. Um, so it's a the term black is a very all-encompassing term. In 1790, 1791, another organization called the St. George's Bay Company established a town called Granville Town on the coast of Sierra Leone. So this is the first attempt to create, using a corporation model, to create a township for resettlement. And it doesn't really go very well. But shortly after that, in 1791, 1792, all of these groups kind of reorganize, create the Sierra Leone Company, and they established a town called Freetown on the west coast of Sierra Leone. And that became a permanent settlement, and it's still there today. And if you're not familiar with uh, West African geography, let's take a quick look at the map. So open the, up in the top left-hand corner, there's Charleston, and you see the Panama, Florida. And here's the west coast of Flor uh, excuse me, Africa. And here's Sierra Leone, there's Freetown, and just... Look ahead, uh, here's Liberia, which we're going to be talking about in a few minutes. So places like Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Liberia, Sierra Leone, uh, Guinea, Guinea-Bissau, these are the traditional areas that enslaved Africans were coming from to places like Charleston. So this is a settlement back in the heart of their ancestral land. So here's some contemporary maps late 18th century, early 19th century maps of Freetown, Sierra Leone. So it's on the coast, it's a mountainous kind of region, or at least they have more hills than we do here in, in the low country. And Freetown is actually at the bottom of this image uh, on the south side of the Sierra Leone River. And here is an accompanying or, or neighboring area um, that we'll talk about in just a moment as well. But if you look up at a modern map of Freetown, it's right here. So, back to Boston King. Uh, in January, uh, he sets out with his wife to Sierra Leone. And it's a three-month voyage, and they get from Nova Scotia to Sierra Leone. Uh, so they settled at Freetown, and you know that opposite shore on the other side of the Sierra Leone River uh, called the Bullum Shore. That's where uh, Boston and Violet eventually settled. The summer of 92, shortly after their arrive, Violet died. So Boston King is all on his own at that time. But his life starts a new journey because he becomes not only a Methodist minister, he becomes a literate man and some people, some white British folk in Sierra Leone say, this Boston King's really got his act together. You know, let's sponsor him to go back to England to get more of an education and he can become a better resource for his new Sierra Leone community if we supply him with an education. So he spends two years studying in England, and he's studying things like theology and literature and history, and he becomes a very literate man. And that's why we have a memoir from him. So in 1798 was published in England, The Memoirs of the Life of Boston King. It's a fairly short narrative. It's, it's not a, a big book here that we're talking about. But it's a, a narrative where you would take every sentence from that and then you know, write a chapter about what does that sentence mean. Let's unpack the meaning of that. So there's a lot of implications. You can really flesh it out in case you wanted to turn it into a screenplay or something like that. <laughs> in 1802, there's a census in Freetown, Sierra Leone. And Boston King does not appear on the census. So he's deceased by 1802. We have no record of exactly when he died or how he died or where he's buried. Yeah. It's, uh, we don't know that much about him. So he disappears from the record around 1882, excuse me, 1802. 
Uh, so there ends 1760 in the Dorchester Road area of South Carolina to 1800, 1801 in Sierra Leone. He made it back to his parents' ancestral land with his family. And uh, even though we don't know all the details, it's enough of the story that it allows us to imagine what the lives of life were for thousands of his contemporaries. And speaking of contemporaries, let's switch gears now and talk about John Kizel or Kaisel, however you want to pronounce his name. Uh, you'll understand what I mean in just a moment. There is a biography of this man that was recently published. Uh, Kevin Lowther is the author of this book. We have copies of it in the library system. You should check it out. This may actually be a documentary in the future. The author is working with a film crew about turning this into a documentary. So John Cazell, I prefer the pronunciation Cazell, but I may be in the minority. He's born in 1760 in the Galinas region of Sierra Leone. So he's actually born in Africa. And he's not an anonymous kind of person. He actually uh, wrote about his family growing up in uh, the west coast of Africa. So he's captured in 1773. So at age 13, he leaves his native land and is sold to a, tr a slave trader on the west coast of Africa, put on board a ship, makes that middle passage across the Atlantic, and comes to the port of Charleston, and is sold at auction on board the ship on the docks of Charleston in 1773. He's purchased by a German widow named Esther Kaisel, Kizel, I don't know how to pronounce that, and by the way, let me just make a little diversion here. There's some discussion of this in the biography, too. How did he acquire that name, John Kazell or Kaisel? He had an African name for 13 years, but he never wrote it down. He, he didn't revert to his African name when he went back to Africa. Um, did, did he call himself John, or did Esther say, your name is now John? Probably not, because Boston's name, you know, we talked about Boston King. It was very common for white masters in places like Charleston to give their newly arrived African slaves non-Christian names like Boston or Denmark or uh, you know Saluda, uh, not Christian names like John. If John was baptized, then he would acquire a new name. And so think about that when you're looking through early records of South Carolina and you come across names of uh, enslaved men named Stepney. Well, what's Stepney? It's not Stephanie. Stepney is a place name in England. So somebody from England named this African man after a place they were familiar with. If Stepney gets baptized, maybe he becomes Charles or Paul or John, something like that. Um, so we don't know how John acquired this name. But in 1773, he's living in a household with this German widow who is herself an immigrant to South Carolina. And just a few years later, remember the British captured Charleston. So we don't know, we don't have any autobiographical story about what John was doing during those years. But we know that he was in Charleston when the British Army came through. And somehow, after the capture of Charleston in May of 1780, John becomes free. We don't know exactly how that happened, but he probably walked away from his household and went to the British authorities and said, hey, I'm with you guys. If you're going to offer me freedom, what do you need me to do? So in the rest of 1780, we know that he's sided with the British because in October of 1780, at the Battle of Kings Mountain in western South Carolina, on very near the North Carolina border, the, the Americans won the day at the Battle of Kings Mountain and captured all of these British troops. And John Cazell was captured by the Americans in October of 17. So he's traveling with the British Army into South Carolina. But in the winter of 1780, he escapes from his American captors and makes his way all the way back to Charleston. We don't know what he's doing for the next two years, but in December of 1782, John evacuates South Carolina with the rest of the British forces. So remember, and this is where it becomes a very parallel story with Boston King. The British army are, the British forces in general are pulling out of North America after uh, the Battle of Yorktown in October 1781. It's clear that they're going to lose the war. They start pulling out. So let's make a quick diversion into the British evacuation of South Carolina. So 
in the second half of 1782. The British are slowly pulling things out. Everybody can see, oh, look, the British are packing up. They're leaving. We're going we're to win this war. Um, but there's a final big massive exodus on the 14th of December, 1782. So British forces and British transport ships have been trickling out of the port of Charleston in the second half of 1782. But on the 14th of March, there are hundreds of British ships that pull up their anchors and sail out in one big final push. And that's really the end of the war in South Carolina. But on that day, we know that from British records that they took with them at least 5,333 formerly enslaved South Carolinian men, women, and children. Because the British kept great records of this. So some of those people went to East Florida. That was the British colony of East Florida, which actually collapsed uh, shortly after this, and it went back to the Spanish. So those people had to leave and find somewhere else to live. Some of those people went to Jamaica. Some of those people went to Barbados, to the Bahamas. And some of those people went to New York, like John Kaisel, and then on to Nova Scotia. So again, joining this parallel track with Boston King. So back to the, the biography. 1783 to 1791, we know John Cazell is in Nova Scotia. He was going with the British forces from Charleston to New York to Nova Scotia. But guess what? His name does not appear in the Book of Negroes. He followed that path. We know he was on those British transports, but he, his name was left out for whatever reason from the Book of Negroes. Um, we know that once he settles in Nova Scotia, he's living down the road from people like Boston King. And down the road from another guy who used to live in Charleston named John Morant. John Morant, or Morant, however you pronounce his name. There's another interesting story. I'll mention him. He's worthy of his own program. He was a free man of color, born in New York, moved to Charleston, became a professional musician, and then became a professional musician with the British Army, left Charleston, went to New York, and... Um, had an interesting life. He never made it back to Africa. He didn't live that long. But he also became a preacher, hmm. just like Boston King. And uh, we know in Nova Scotia, John Cazell married a woman named Phyllis, who had kind of a similar path uh, in life that, that he did. In 1792, they are also, just like Boston King, among several thousand people who are emigrating to this new place called Freetown, Sierra Leone. And just like Boston King, he was invited to go to England in 1794 to receive an education. But John Cazell, because he grew up to the age of 13 in Africa, and his family was fairly prominent in his community in uh, Africa, he was already a literate man. And he traveled to London to expand his education and to start a career as a businessman. So, a little bit of geography here. John Cazell uh, came back, after two years in England, he came back in 1796, opened a trading post at Sherbro Island, which is just a little bit south of Freetown. So if you look up at the top of the screen, there's Freetown. So just about 70 miles to the south of Sherbro Island. This is where John Cazell's ancestors came from, this general area. So he's kind of moving back home. Um, and 1796, he, like Boston King, became a preacher, but not a Methodist preacher, a Baptist preacher. And in the early 1800s, we know from his own correspondence, letters he's writing to people in Sierra Leone and people in England, he is working to stamp out the slave trade. So, I mean, that's just a great story. Here's a man who was captured at age 13, sold into slavery, had this adventure to Charleston, to New York, to Nova Scotia, and back to Africa, and he's fighting the slave trade. Mm. And that's really what we know most about him uh, in the early 19th century. He's a businessman, he's trading, he's working in import-export, and he is an agent for helping to stamp out the slave trade. In 1811, while in Freetown, Sierra Leone, he met a man named Paul Cuffey. Anybody heard of Paul Cuffey? Yeah, a couple of people have. Interesting character. Let's take a quick diversion and talk about Paul Cuffey. And here you see a portrait of him that was painted in the early 19th century, maybe right around the time of his death, maybe slightly after his death. Paul Cuffey died in 1817. 
He's a native of Massachusetts. His father was an African man who came to America as a slave. His mother was a Native American woman of one of those tribes of coastal Massachusetts. So in the, in the lingo of British America in the late 18th century, he would have been a mestizo or a musty. He's part African, part Native American, um, but you know he is a free person of color. His mother was free, therefore by the law he is free. He becomes a businessman. He is a Quaker man. His father was freed by a Quaker man in Massachusetts. So Quakerism uh, is often associated with abolitionist spirit in early America. And so uh, Paul Covey is Quaker uh, in belief. He's a businessman and he's a mariner. He grew up working on the ocean. And he actually acquires a small fleet of his own vessels to do his own trading with. So he becomes a very prominent and a reasonably wealthy man in uh, Massachusetts. In 1811, he and some like-minded people formed this society called the Friendly Society of Sierra, Sierra Leone. Now, this is 1811. People have been going from North America back to Sierra Leone since 1792. So it's not new. But people like Paul Cuffey are looking at that, that tradition, looking at that passage, that route, and saying, you know, maybe that's a good idea. Maybe there are more people, for example, in Massachusetts or in the other American states who would benefit by taking advantage of this trip back to Africa. So he and some friends set up this friendly society to try to encourage trade and communication and to create a route from Massachusetts to Sierra Leone. So in 1811, he makes his first trip because he owns several ships, he outfits his own ships, and 1811 goes to West Africa, does some trading, meets some people, you know, it's kind of a scouting expedition. He's meeting some people, creating contacts, and then goes back to America, where he is immediately told, you have violated this trade embargo. We're, we're almost at war with Britain, and you violated that by going and trading with these British people in Sierra Leone, so we're going to confiscate all your cargo. Mm -hmm. But Paul Cuffey goes to the White House and talks to President James Madison about this. Mm. Madison says, oh, okay, well, you didn't, you didn't realize that you were violating this. Well, we'll give you your, your cargo back. You're fine. You just go about your business. He actually went to the White House to sort that out. And for the next couple of years, he's planning trips to Africa. He's planning trips back to West Africa and uh, trying to encourage other people to invest in this venture. And he goes back again in 1816, and he's trading again on the coast of Sierra Leone. Uh, unfortunately, he died in 1817. So that's kind of the end of the venture. But it's not the end of that effort to repatriate people back to, um, to Africa. And so I want to introduce you to the next stage, which is the American Colonization Society. And these are impressions of their... Um, the die for their wax seal, the corporate seal of the American Colonization Society, which was founded in Washington, D.C. in December of 1816. This was kind of a strange organization because the membership can, consisted of two types of people. On the one hand, you have people who are of African descent or people who are of abolitionist spirit and think, you know, we should allow people to return to, to their ancestral land. Uh, if it had not been for the evils of slavery, these people would not be uh, forced to be here. And so we should allow them the opportunity to go back. And the other half of the membership was people who said, I don't really like having these African people here in America. I want to move them out. So two very different kinds of mindsets are behind the formation of this organization in 1860. So they're, they're trying to create a route for uh, people to emigrate back to Africa. And they're actually inspired by Captain Paul Cuffey, who had made this journey in 1811, 1816. He's going to prove in that concept for Americans. And so even though Paul Cuffey was not a member of this organization, he had died in 1817, um, he is really their inspiration. And so in 1820, the first of these settlers that are sponsored by or moving to Africa under the aegis of the American Colonization Society. The first of them go back in 1820. And who's there to help them, to join them? It's John Kaisel. So John Kaisel is not an official agent or member of the American Colonization Society, 
but they need somebody on the other end to help these people who are arriving. So John Cazell um, uh, is kind of an agent for the creation of Liberia. And if you <coughs> read about the history of Liberia, you're not going to read about John Cazell as one of the founding um, agents or uh, founding fathers, if you will, of Liberia. But he was an agent on the ground already in Sierra Leone. So you see Sierra Leone and Freetown up here at the top of the screen, and here's Liberia on the right. So 1822, the American Colonization Society is sending their first settlers to Liberia. John Cazell is an important agent in making that transition. So between 1822 and 1860, the beginning of the American Civil War, are more than 15,000 African Americans who have left these United States to go back to Liberia. And if you count people of African descent who left from the Caribbean, from places like Jamaica and Bar Barbados and Antigua and um, the Bahamas, that number is even higher. But from the United States, more than 15,000 had gone to Liberia before the Civil War. And after the Civil War, there are thousands more as well. So Liberia has a strong connection to, the South, to South, South Carolina and to these United States in general. But back to John Cazell, just a little bit more about his biography. According to his own correspondence, according to his own business records, we know that while he's engaged in trade, he's still fighting the slave trade. I remember in 1807, the British government prohibited the African slave trade. They didn't abolish slavery in the British territories, like uh, Sierra Leone. But they abolished the slave trade. So Britain, in 1807, says we're no longer going to allow African people to be taken out of Africa by British agents. The Spanish are still doing it, but not the British in 1807. And it's not until 1833 that Britain abolishes slavery in all of its territories. That's 1833. So during that era, John Kaisel is on the ground in West Africa fighting the slave trade. He's alerting British authorities. That man over there is capturing slaves. This man is helping these other people to find slaves and, and smuggle them out of West Africa. So he is not a spy, but he is an agent who's speaking aloud and saying, this has got to stop, and I'm going to be that person to, to uh, help alert the authorities. So an important work. But after about 1830, he disappears. We don't know how or when he died. He had a family, and his family continued long after him. John Cazell disappears sometime in the 1830s. So just like Boston King, we don't know much about the end of his life. But what an interesting life it was, from Africa to South Carolina, using his wits to get out of slavery, going to the cold winters of Nova Scotia, and going to England and becoming an educated businessman and coming back to West Africa and helping his ancestral people prevent other people from falling into that same route of slavery. Interesting life. So if you like these kinds of stories, let me just mention a few other things. And by the way, I do have a bibliography I will hand out. I'm going to mention a few books uh, that I think if you read this, uh, these books and you're inspired to read more, there's some other good things. I mentioned uh, a, a book about the Book of Negroes earlier. So Ruth White Holmes Whitehead, who's born in the Low Country and then moved to Nova Scotia to be a museum curator, uh, authored this book. She was the co-editor of the Memoirs of Boston King. She also published this book a few years ago about black loyalists, southern settlers of Nova Scotia's first free black communities. So in this book, she talks about people not only leaving the low country, but North Carolina, Virginia, other places, and going to New York. And what were their conditions like in New York before they moved on to Nova Scotia? And what were the conditions like on the ground in Birchtown, in Shelburne, Nor uh, Nova Scotia, when they first arrived there? She's got all the details. It's a great book that I would highly recommend. Um, Simon Shama, who's a very prolific historian, very uh, widely read historian, published a book that maybe you haven't seen before called Rough Crossings. It's about Britain, he's a British historian, it's about Britain and their participation in the slave trade and the British conundrum during the American Revolution of how to deal with all these formerly enslaved refugees who were streaming into the British Army. That's something that Ruth Whitehead talks about in her book, 
Simon Shama's got a big, thick book about that as well, recently published. Um, another person, I mentioned uh, John Morant as a person who made a similar journey from uh, South Carolina uh, up north, and another one as Alauda Equiano, also known as Gustavus Vasa. In 1789, in London, he published an interesting narrative of the life of Alauda Equiano, or Gustavus Vasa, the African. So it's a narrative about his life, and he talks about being born in Africa, enslaved, taken to South Carolina, escaping with the British, and having adventures of his own. Um, Equiano never made it back to Africa. He settled in Britain, but he's an interesting character. And there's actually been some scholarly debate in recent years about was he really born in the west coast of Africa, in Guinea, like he says he was in the narrative, or was he actually born in South Carolina? And he's taking stories that he's heard from other African slaves and kind of creating his own uh, fictional narrative about his early life. You know, that's an academic debate. You can read the book for yourself. Um, and I mentioned the Book of Negroes before, and that's an actual document created in the 1780s by the British Army. But you may have heard of a novel by Canadian author Lawrence Hill that came out in 2007. This was published in Canada under the title, The Book of Negroes. And it's a work of fiction. And I had the privilege of working with Larry on this book. He wrote to me and said, I'm, I'm working on this story, and I need somebody on the ground to help me with South Carolina geography and place names and uh, some you know, factual details about the low country of South Carolina in the 18th century. And I helped him a little bit with that. Um, but he published this book in 2007 in Canada. And the American publisher said, we don't like the title. So they made him change the title. So this book same book was published in America under the title Someone Knows My Name and it came out in 2008 and it was actually made into a mini-series on the cable network BET so it's a mini-series you can watch online you can probably uh, find the DVDs of that as well uh, but it's a great book South Carolina low country figures prominently in this novel um, and that's all I have for recommendations right now. I really appreciate y'all coming out on this beautiful spring day.